But as I said, it's, it's a real, uh, real pleasure to be with you, and this has been uh, a journey of mine for, for many years, and I, I remember probably now about six or seven years ago, um, the journey started for me with AI on Amazon. I, um, I, 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 I'm a big reader, so I read like you know, one, or, one or two books a week, or try to, and um, I, Amazon suggested to me a book called uh, Pred uh, Predictive Analytics, and it was how to predict who's going to lie, cheat, steal, or die, or something like that. And I, I was doing a lot of work with the International Spine Study Group at the time, and I thought, wow, I mean, we're doing correlation analysis, and the insurance companies and uh, investment banks and Wall Street has been doing multivariable predictive models for so many years, trying to maximize their their profits, this is something where we could really bring this into spine surgery. So quite literally, I bought the two copies of the book, one for me uh, and, and one for my, my big research student at the time, Justin Shear, who as a, as a neurosurgery resident has 150 publications already. And whenever I go anywhere, they always ask, where's Professor Shear? <laughs> he's, still, he's still a resident. Um, but quite literally, that, how that, that is exactly how the predictive modeling work in the International Spine Study Group and then the European Spine Study Group started was that Amazon <laughs> predicted that I would like a book on predictive modeling. So I thought that was kind of it was an interesting, uh, interesting uh, story. Um, my disclosures, none of which are really uh, relevant to this talk, although I do direct the predictive analytics effort for the ISSG and direct the the collaborative effort with the European Spine Study Group and Ferran you'll hear from um, tomorrow. Well, I always like to, to sort of take a step back and, and picture exactly the magnitude of the problem that we're facing. And the, I've charged with the talk of, you know, why does spine surgery have to change? Well, if you take a, a deep dive on this, and this is from a review that we were doing, uh, we, had, we were very lucky to have um, um, a great uh, student who's actually an MBA, now she's getting her, her uh, MD degree at UCSF, and she did a deep dive on this like you would do at McKinsey or something for us on the socioeconomic burden of low back pain. And this is one of the articles that she pulled up. If you look at direct and indirect costs of low back pain in the United States, it's over $440 billion. Just think about that for a moment. It's the number one cause of disability worldwide. We have two different training programs that teach people how to treat that disease. <laughs> Imagine for cardiac surgery if, you know, half of them were, I don't know, orthopedists or something. <laughs> like, or they were trained in some other specialty and they divided, you know, divided the training process leading to greater heterogeneity, how, how that would work. Um, and these patients are getting older, they're living longer. As we see here, the rates of adult spinal deformity surgery are going up. Um, Tremendous economic burden. It's high prevalence, over 60%. Uh, increased 157% in 10 years. And patients have a greater expectation of higher function as they get older. The, the other specialties are doing a great job. The, the orthopedic surgeons are replacing their hips and knees. They're getting stents. Their cancers are being treated through advancements in cancer research. These, these patients want to be active into their older years. And this is creating quite an economic problem, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. When we couple this to the outcomes of the patients that we're treating, we, see, we start to see a huge problem. The complication rates for these patients from an ISSG study is over 70%. Some of these are structural, so implant and radiographic complications, neurological. I'll, I'll talk about a bit about AI and neuromonitoring tomorrow. Uh, a lot of these problems may be improved through a systems-based approach, and a lot of the prediction of patients that are going to have medical issues may be, we can be more accurate through different data sets, such as telomeres and aging phenotypes, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in the talk. But this is it's a huge problem. Now, these patients are, have multiple comorbidities, they're getting older, many of these patients are in their 70s or 80s. Complications often get better, but it's only part part of the problem. We also have a tremendous problem with failure in these patients, so just object failure. They get reoperated on. So they're not like a cardiac patient that had a stent, 
and then maybe four years later they have another stent and then maybe they have a cabbage and then they have another stent and this is going on 20 years and they're thinking, wow, that's a great cardiologist, you know, he's keeping me alive. What do they think about a spine surgeon where, where his cases keep getting revised? They think, oh, this is, this is crazy, this is, uh, this is unacceptable care or that should have been done better the first time. And maybe in some cases they're right. The problem is the failure rates really are unacceptable. It's not gonna be, um, not going to be sustainable long term if we keep reoperating on these patients. We see PJK, we see rod fracture, pseudoarthrosis, we see patients that just fail to improve. A subset of patients that maybe shouldn't have this type of surgery, that are maybe identifiable through advanced data techniques before they have surgery, we're still operating on these patients and they're failing to get better and they're economically failing our system. They're costing a lot of money and again that's not going to be possible in the future. Let's just take a look at some actual numbers. If we look at a deep dive, this is from a huge re review that we're currently doing on failure. <laughs> we, we decided to actually just, just take it head on and just <laughs> do a study on how are we doing in adult deformity. Rod fracture rates 9 to 54 percent. If we look specifically, maybe at the best data set we have on adult scoliosis, this is five-year data from the only NIH trial on scoliosis, the five-year rod fracture rates were over 38%. Many of those rod fractures are being re-operated on. So this is, this is just data that we submitted this year to the SRS. This is ASLS data from the NIH trial. So this is five-year outcome data. PJK rates, up to over 40% rates of PJK. Many of these patients have PJF. They're also being re-operated upon. If we look specifically at reoperation rates, we see ranges from 7 to 30 percent, with an average reoperation rate in adult deformity of 20 percent. So let's look at it from a different perspective. We're always so focused as surgeons on what we do, but let's look at what's going on around us. Well, heart lung transplant, we're doing better than they are, <laughs> but those patients are really sick. <laughs> okay, that's like a 41% reoperation rate. Okay, but we're not doing as well as open uh, AAA repair. We're not. We're about the same as free flaps that have compromised vasculature. Pediatric cardiac surgery, we're not as good. How about if we compare ourselves to another very common procedure in the aging population, arthroplasty? We're terrible. Think about procedures that keep people going, stents arthroplasties. Comparing ourselves to those procedures, we look awful. <laughs> it's not going to be possible. If we look at cost effectiveness and we model our, our, our procedures out over a 10-year period, and if you think about an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, maybe 100,000, maybe 70,000, different economies set them at different, different levels, we are only cost effective if we don't reoperate on patients on a t in a 10-year period. So we've, we have failed. <laughs> we, we're reoperating on those, many of those patients before 10 years. We are cost ineffective. And we are ripe now in this, in this economy, which is changing, this healthcare economy, we're, we're, we're ripe for rationing of care, where there's gonna be some sort of paradigm change. This can't go on. What have we done to solve it? Well, we've spent a lot of money a lot of things that we're not being reimbursed for. This is what UCSF does. This is our strategy. Many, many different rods. We're doing a lot of things where I won't even read out on the slide, but <laughs> we're, we're not being paid for. Plastic surgery, two surgeons. Uh, we're doing all these things that's occurring in additional cost. So we're preventing failure by spending more money. That's probably not gonna work. We have a tremendously increasing Medicare population. Remember, that prevalence data on scoliosis was on older patients. These patients are being processed through the clinic, they're being operated on 83 million people of Medicare age by 2050. And here's the real problem that I was just talking to, to, to Jeff Martha about earlier. If you compare this to other competitive diseases uh, for, against adult spinal deformity, so you have a certain amount of money to spend and then you compare it to what are, what are other diseases of the aging population that we're facing? Dementia is estimated to cost $1 trillion in the U.S. 
musculoskeletal disease, another disease of the aging population, but arthroplasty, they do a lot better. They go on and have a great life. They don't get reoperated on. They get stents. They, they do okay. No one's going to argue with taking care of a, a patient that has dementia. They're going to need care of some type of facility. But people might start to argue about spine surgery. And here's just some more, more numbers on, on the dementia problem. Huge problem in Asia as well. It's going to drain the Asian economies. Estimates of one to one and a half trillion dollars. So we have to start to be smarter and figure out a way, a different, a different way to practice that's based on data and is not driven through innovation simply by making different implants. And then here's just another estimate. Now they've tried to privatize some aspects of Medicare, but the original Medicare model was going to be insolvent by 2026. So I think I've made that point. <laughs> I think you would concede that the current paradigm is just not, not going to work. So then wh what are we going to do to change this? Well, over the last 10 years, we, we focus, and I, so when I say we, I mean as surgeons and also as industry, and many companies continue to focus on things that are easily monetizable, things that they can put in a patient, charge an insurance company or a hospital for, and get paid. But if you really think of how much, since the first multi-axial screw was designed, how much does implant innovation change care? Not very much, right? I think we, we can be honest. And we have to, as a group, as surgeons, as patients, I'll talk more about that later. We're going to have to part with more data. We're going to have to become comfortable with sharing more of our data um, to enable that data to improve care of ourselves and others. But industry is also going to have to undergo a change in, in how they sell and teach and support their products. It's no longer going to be necessarily be all the jock, you know, right out of you know, college football or a frustrated high school football player. It's going to be... Guys that come up in the mechanical engineering lab, the structural engineering lab, the computing lab, these are the guys that you're going to want on your team in the operating room. They're not going to be necessarily compensated in commission structures. This is going to be very difficult to figure out how to do this. And this is something that industry has to solve. This is thankfully not our problem, specifically as surgeons, but this is a big problem to support this ecosystem. It's something that's going to have to be you know, confronted. As surgeons, we've done a pretty good job. You can see we, we responded to this. We received support um, from industry to start a large registry group. We've been studying and publishing papers in adult spinal deformity. This is the number of papers. You can see an exponential takeoff in just studying this issue over the last um, several years. But we have problems like this. We've been focusing so much on correlation analysis. And you couldn't go to a spine meeting you know, over the last 10 years and not just have like, oh, if you, the equation was basically this. If you operated on a patient and you reestablished certain sagittal plane parameters, that patient was going to do well. And if you didn't do that, they weren't going to do well. And that's been, you know, totally proven in the data. But problem is now our compass is broken. I'll show you. Uh, these maps have to change. It's not going to be a simple correlation analysis anymore. This was Glassman's original paper. The best R-squared value they had in these patients was 0.43. This is the real data now. This data has been, I'll tell you, it's been verified over three years. We knew this several years ago. We didn't submit it. We added more patients to see if the results stayed. Still held. We added more patients to see if it stayed. It still held. So preoperatively, the sagittal plane accounts for only 11% of the variation in that patient's disability score. <laughs> okay, digest that. And then post-op, it accounts for 5%, two years post-op. Okay, so our guiding paradigm, our compass in this, you know, this heterogeneous abyss of trying to figure out how to care for these complex patients, well, I wouldn't say gone, but it's no longer a simple equation of this this alignment equals this outcome. And, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point too much, but the same holds true for all the other parameters, PILL, pelvic tilt, even worse. So our compass has been broken. We need to think about things in a different way. Well, let's look at outcomes research. So this is one of the main things that industry did. They said, look, we have to fund these groups. We have to show a benefit of what, what we're up, what we're, what we're investing in, uh, these, these procedures. So this is typically what you get in terms of outcome. 
It looks pretty good, right? So you operate on a patient, the operation compared to non-operative treatment results in a significant uh, clinical benefit, it seems like. And wow, look at that, you know, SRS-22 getting so much better. But here's the data that makes that up. <laughs> a lot of patients didn't get better. <laughs> a lot of patients did really poorly. A lot of patients got really a lot better. Um, and what's quoted in these papers is actually average values. So if you're a good surgeon, patients sitting before you in the clinic, you think about a pathway of caring for these patients, and you, the patient says, doctor, how am I going to do after this procedure? What are you going to do? You're probably, if you're good, you're going to pull up an ISSG paper, an ESSG paper, a paper from Colorado, a paper from San Francisco, or whatever. They quote average values. But if you, if you quote a patient, the average value from those papers, you're lying to 90% of the patients. That's not how specifically they're going to do. So this, this has to change. I think I've made the point that we have to do better. The approach to this that's probably most effective, we can learn from cancer. The Emperor of All Maladies is a great book about using data to launch into a major U.S. war on cancer. I think we can agree that the treatment paradigms for cancers ha have changed. These patients are living longer because they're receiving targeted therapies, targeted now to the receptors that they particularly have, to their disease burden, to their staging, the clinical trials have become more refined, um, and we've made huge headways in a lot of these cancers. Now we have uh, liquid biopsies and uh, genetic analyses. It's really become a lot more sophisticated through large cancer registries. But the largest spine registries we have now, at least for adult deformity, are still only around, you know, between two and 4,000 patients if we combine them or, or we don't. Information's probably gonna be our, really our next enabling technology. The, the next thing Medtronic makes or the, any of the companies make that's gonna maximally benefit patients is not gonna be something that they put in patients. These companies are gonna become data companies that analyze a problem and they interpret what they need to make that problem better, and they make something maybe, maybe that puts in a patient or maybe that monitors a patient that solves that problem. It's no longer gonna be a monetization strategy of making an implant, putting it in, and getting paid for that. How amazing would it be, like I, I grew up in the age when navigation was just taking off, but I remember my, my attendings telling me back at that point, anyone that needs navigation to operate on the brain is not a good brain surgeon. <laughs> True, true stories. They, did, they don't know their brain anatomy. And we know that's just absolutely ridiculous now. Just look at it in hindsight and how our perspective has changed. You don't see any brain surgery going on now almost without, without some type of enabling tech. The same is probably going to be true in the future of sitting there facing a patient and being able to picture in real time alternative treatment strategies and then and imagine with high accuracy to not only control that patient's realignment as best you can possibly using machine intelligence, but also to predict their outcomes, to predict their risks, to predict their costs. So I like to think of enabling tech kind of in, in three different tiers. So one tier of enabling tech I call like the taxi to Uber. Now you, it used to be you go to New York City, you needed a, an experienced taxi driver that had been driving taxis for 20 years you know, to get you to some esoteric restaurant you're trying to find or some small museum or something. Nowadays, some high school kid or college kid can do that using navigation on Uber. So this essentially lifts the general population of surgeons up to sort of a medium level. Just about anybody can now put in pedicle screws as well as Larry using navigation. That's un the unfortunate truth. Larry's initial differentiating skill was he could freehand, you know, any pedicle. Now, our, our residents can probably put screws in using navigation, probably as accurately as, as Dr. Lenke. The next tier is really to take kind of the medium level surgeon and sort of leverage some of the power of data to make that surgeon, to enable that surgeon to see things that maybe that surgeon, you know, couldn't see using human intelligence. And a great an analogy is in aviation, senior pilots work with industry to develop enabling tech that is in basically every commercial cockpit. It moves a lot of people around doing a lot of different things around the world, you know, every day. This is commercial aviation to make it safer. One of the big techniques that's appeared recently is now, uh, I like to read a lot of the other medical journals. I, I don't read as many of the spine journals, but I like to read the other medical journals because it teaches me about other fields. It's a lot more eye-opening than just reading like spine journals. 
So if you look in on call, like, la- the big journals like Lancet and JAMA, you see a lot of clustering going on. They're essentially trying to find patterns in data and rethink old problems and see whether there are new answers to old problems. So one old problem was, um, do heart failure patients with atrial fibrillation uh, benefit from beta blockade? I bet you spine surgeons didn't think you'd be hearing about that problem today. But the interesting thing was, they thought that that problem was solved, that beta blockers weren't effective. Well, actually, they did clustering analysis of these huge, you know, they combined a bunch of different databases, and they found that actually for for certain clusters of patients within, you know, this this disease process that they hadn't studied before using clustering, it was extremely effective. (laughs) But they were, when you apply it overall, you lose the treatment effect. So by utilizing clustering, they were able to find a new answer to an old problem. We can also use clustering, and we've published this, to establish a whole new adult spinal deformity classification, now based on unsupervised machine learning, where rather than some weak correlation to the sagittal plane, we give surgeons what they want. This is combined work with the European and American registries. We can give them a plot of risk versus benefit. So they can, we can cluster a patient, say this patient belongs in this treatment group, and this gives you real-time risk-benefit information, which is helpful for shared decision-making. So, One other area to to think about, which is kind of interesting information, is we all like to think that we're so good as surgeons that we're really differentiated from our colleagues at the the top levels, right? It's really not true. When we do a deep dive on this in the registries, we find that complications vary between, you know, uh, marquee sites or experience sites, whatever you want to call them, only about 5 to 10 percent. Outcomes only varied about 1 to 2 percent. Costs varied a lot. <laughs> That's probably understandable. Regional cost variation, et cetera. Um, but what it tells us is this, and this is the tier three. Like, just simply like making predictive models or, or making some of this basic enabling tech, and the emphasis in enabling technology has been on the general population. But a new area that Medtronic's starting to focus on that I think is really interesting is how do you make the fighter pilot better with enabling tech? How do you make the absolute best surgeon, the marquee surgeon, the master surgeon, what kind of enabling tech is going to make that surgeon better? What do they want to see in their, in their heads-up display? What, what information do they want, or what technology is going to make the master surgeon better, like the fighter pilot level surgeon? So one of those is potentially having machines bend the rods. We've shown that master surgeons, these are all surgeons that had more than 10, 15 years experience. When they bend rods without a template, their deviations are about 20 degrees. So even master surgeons can't bend rods accurately. That's some human error. And even if they bend them accurately, and one of the things we found was that some were biased, they overbent them, some were biased, they underbent them. But we also found variability, human error. Some of the times they overbent them, sometimes they underbent them to the same degree. So there's both bias and error affecting how we do things that machines will have no bias and no error when they do it. They sign that, that mitigates some medical legal risk potentially. We've given them the best available. Outcomes the same. Surgeons historically are much better at predicting risk than they are at predicting outcome. And we're also better, we're biased toward predicting or our skill set is biased toward predicting early risk. We're very poor at predicting long-range risk. The machines are really much more accurate at predicting revision, for example, one or two years out. One of the other areas where we need to do better um, is in uh, benchmarking. Benchmarking is, you know, co- companies benchmark employees. <laughs> Benchmark. We benchmark ourselves. Uh, governments benchmark us now in healthcare. If you look at academic medical centers versus private medical centers in major cities, we see that oftentimes the academic medical centers look terrible compared to our private hospitals that are right next door. But that's is this a, re- a real reflection of what's going on? No. They're, they're doing one-level fusions or ACDFs, and we're doing you know the T3 to pelvis revision, double PSO, in the 80-year-old patients. The problem has been that we don't have uh, uh, accurate and sophisticated tools to do adequate stratification and benchmarking. So look at this example just on PJK. So if we used to just draw a line across the registries and say, this is the average rate of PJK. If you exceed it, um, you're doing poorly. You're not doing as good a job. If you, if you don't hit it, you're, you're doing pretty well if you're under the, the line. But then we use a predictive model <laughs> and we predict what your PJK rate should be on your actual patient population, and we see that 
some of the sites that seemed like they were really good performers were actually underperformers. They weren't doing as good a job because they were still treating simpler patients. And some of the sites that looked terrible were actually doing a pretty good job. But only through multivariable predictive models can we do accurate benchmarking. And this is something that, you know, the, the new cadre, you know, now they're like the, the, the online, you know, the online uh, masters of health administrations. These, these people are coming out. The health administrators are growing. At like a, it's like a vertical line, you know. But they're not being educated in how to really do this appropriate type of stratification. Another interesting example of machines versus humans is when you simulate operating according to a machine recommendation versus uh, a human recommendation. Essentially, we did a simulation in our data set. When we operated, when we simulated operating on only the patients that the machine said would reach MCID versus all the patients that had surgery, basically the surgeon said that patient would benefit from surgery, we saw a 684% increase in the qualies using the machine strategy versus human strategy. The machine could tell who was really going to do better. So think about that when you, when you think about cost effectiveness. We can predict cost with 70% accuracy using these predictive models. We can predict catastrophic outliers, like war non-warranty patients, with about 90% um, accuracy. What does this allow us to do? It allows us to use predictive modeling at the, at the population level, potentially, to set filters. Think about going to the healthcare economy of Spain or the UK, NHS, and saying, okay, you're going to treat adult spinal deformity, you have a certain amount of money to spend, let's set a filter here. How many, what's the percent chance they need to reach MCID? What reoperation rate or complication rate are you willing to tolerate? And we can, if we, if we simulate applying this in the U.S. population, we could decrease surgery rates on patients that we're not helping by up to 41 percent, could re result in significant health care savings. And I'll just finish up, I, I always like to give you guys kind of a, a glimpse in the next, you know, five minutes of the future. And one of the things that the predictive models are only as good as the data that we put in. This is one of my favorite quotes from um, Donald Rumsfeld, um, an interesting character, but certainly a smart, a smart person. And this is so insightful about the whole f field of data, because you can go 10 years down the line, and if you're not collecting the right data point, somebody can come out of nowhere and just have a much more accurate model because they started like using genetics or, or bio, biological data. So we recently launched William Shatner into space. I would say he looks pretty good at age 90, right? Now some of that might be uh, some of our plastic surgical colleagues may have assisted him, I'm not really sure. But, but this, and, and the fact that Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for telomeres, is at our institution, and just my daily practice of seeing patients that look very different, they're a young 60 or they're you know, an old 40 or something, made me start to think about using uh, telomeric aging data in trying to predict uh, risk and complication. So the short of it is, we won this, uh, this was, won the Hibbs Award last year for basic science at the SRS. This is the single most predictive variable. <laughs> so we've spent years in the ISSG uh, accumulating thousands of patients on predicting risk and out of nowhere comes a biological variable where we have odds ratios of over 26 predicting risk of major complication. So uh, it's important to collect the right data points. We've now entered into a collaboration with TrueAge, which is another epigenetic company uh, based in uh, Kentucky, where we're starting to do aging phenotypes on our spinal deformity patients, trying to figure out you know, who's a bone ager. Um, who's a muscle ager? Who gets muscle atrophy and things as they age? There's a lot of variation in how patients age. It also makes the point that as we look at patients, we need to think about them not as a single point, but as an area under their health curve. And so this is uh, a point that I always make. It's like the elephant in the room at all the spine meetings. We, if you look at every paper on the podium, it's usually one pre-op time point versus maybe three or four post-op time points. But that's not reality. <laughs> reality is that patients fluctuate, and that variation itself is likely to be very predictive, and we're gonna miss a lot of information if we don't look at the variability in pre and post-op. Another thing that this gives us, if we monitor patients preoperatively, is we can do something called preoperative trajectory mapping. This is something that's become very popular in other specialties, more sophisticated data specialties in spine surgery, where if you collect you know, data points on patients every week or every two weeks for several months, you can become very accurate in how that patient's going to do without surgery. 
You can save money on non-operative trials using predictive modeling by predicting their outcomes with non-operative treatment by following them over time. This is something that hasn't yet been applied to spine surgery. The whole idea of creating this integrated health state is where we're gonna go. And how are we gonna fill in that area under the curve? We're gonna fill it in with uh, monitoring, with real-time physical activity monitoring. That's gonna give us the variation preoperatively. It's other data sets that we need to study. And this is a point of significant development. One of the other areas that we're missing is, we're studying blood right now, we're studying epigenetics and telomeric aging, but there's probably a whole lot more information in muscle, in fibroblasts, and in bone. So we've decided just to take a big approach. We don't even know what a lot of these unknown unknowns are, so we're just biobanking the tissue on our spine patients, and we're gonna study them when we come up with interesting questions down the line, study their bone, study their, their tissue, over the years. And then finally, this is another really interesting area uh, that where data science can improve our ability to do research to improve the care of our patients. Inside the clusters, inside the patterns that we find in, these, in this heterogeneous patient population, we have different effect sizes. So you can do clinical, you can cluster first. This is something we learned from oncology. If you cluster first, you get a greater effect size and so when you power your trial, you can do trials of 35 or 60 patients rather than 1,000 patient trials because you're studying similar patients based on 100, 50 to 100 variable systems. So this can save money on trials. Um, it can give you answers much more quickly. And this is something that's been applied in other areas, you know, much more than in, in, uh, in spine surgery. So to, to finish up, um, I think it's obvious we're really entering a new healthcare age. Uh, networks, coordination, information. Medical devices of the future is not something we put in patients. It's likely to be a software solution. This is really a key point, the next one. There's not going to be a clear separation between a patient, a consumer of healthcare, and someone that's contributing to the improvement of healthcare in the future. It's going to be, if you're going to improve healthcare in the future, your own care, others' care, you're going to have to contribute information, either tissue, um, activity information, post-operative outcome information, complication information, radiographic information. We're going to grow this together. We're all in this together, medical device, patients, and surgeons. And I think we can make care a lot more. And now I just uh, want to finish, uh, and I, we're going to take a little break for dinner. Jess going to go next, but I want to set this up with what I call the obligation of Medtronic. I took a really deep dive, and I looked around at a lot of the other ecosystems that were available. And you know, I was looking at working with a lot of different you know, companies in AI. The fact of the matter is, Medtronic is so deep in the pre-op space now with Metacrea, they're accumulating all of this radiographic information. They can do radiomics. They're, they dominate the capital equipment space, the O-arm to the cloud, the stealth, the robot to the cloud, post-operative monitoring, post-operative Metacrea data acquisition. There's no better partner to add in wearable technology, to add in biobanking. Bio so Medtronic is not just, it's not just a privilege of Medtronic that they have all this and through their, their business skills over the success over the years they built this. They have an obligation to the patients and to the surgeons to use this huge ecosystem this, that they've built that no one can compete with in the next decade to work together with us you know, to improve the care of our patients. And I'll just finish with this, my favorite quote, Lost clinical data is a lost opportunity to improve care. I really believe that. So thank you all very much. And uh, I think now we'll, oh, yes, yes, sir. Are you talking about genetics? Epigenetics. Sure. It's a good question. Yeah, actually, uh, there's good research to show, uh, you know, there's a limited amount of time in the talk, but there's, there's good research to show that your, your telomeric age and your telomerase activity is potentially modifiable. So through stress reduction, through mindfulness, through physical activity, through nutrition, through um, diet, through weight loss, you can actually modify your telomere length. 
uh, and your, probably your, your methylation state. Um, so yes, uh, the, the prehabilitation programs, physical programs, nutritional programs, it, may, uh, be, we may, it might not be just permanent, like that's your genetic age, you can't change it. It may be modifiable. There are two commercial companies that do telomeric aging. There's one called Telu Years. I think it was a startup by Elizabeth Blackburn's lab. I'm not sure of the specifics. There's one that's based in Kentucky called True Age. They do different. So the, 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 the analysis systems are different. One, one is based purely on a different way. They quantitate telomeres through PCR, I think. And one is uh, epigenetic or methylation. Um, but True Age is in Kentucky. Do you, know, do you know why they're in Kentucky? Anybody have a guess? Racehorse performance. They're using epigenetics to predict the uh, performance of racehorses. So uh, they're commercially available. They're just consumer, they're direct-to-consumer companies. And they're, try, they're looking for partners to, you know, take their epigenetic data, add it to other data, you know, to make predictive models. Uh, we're doing research with them right now. Um, but I, I think it's a huge part of the equation. That's certainly been our experience, is that if you don't look at the biological data, you're missing a huge part of the data set. Thank you. Thank you.